podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, well, good evening, everyone. This is Frank Nocera from the National Weather Service. It is uh, 6.59 here, so we'll hold on for a couple more minutes before we get started. Um, and just to do an, an audio test here, uh, Bill and Rodney, I assume you could hear me loud and clear? Yes, Frank. Excellent. Yes, can hear you loud and clear. Excellent. So um, we'll start maybe 701, 702. I see people are still checking in uh, as we speak here. So uh, maybe we'll start in about two minutes. Seven o'clock now, we'll start at 702. All right, good evening, everyone. My uh, phone here says 702, so uh, maybe we'll get started, and uh, hopefully everyone can see my screen. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Frank Nocera. I'm a meteorologist with the National Weather Service in Boston, Norton, and I'm actually filling in for uh, Joe tonight, so um, I'm a rookie at this running these uh, presentations, so hopefully I don't make uh, too many mistakes. Uh, but everyone, uh, before we get started, if you could just make sure your microphone is on mute, that will be a great help. Uh, if you have any questions or comments during the presentation, just put them in the uh, in the chat box, and we'll definitely answer uh, most, if not every, question uh, at the end. If you want to watch this webinar again, uh, they're all recorded and posted to our YouTube channel. And uh, feel free to provide us feedback at the uh, email here below, Joseph dot Della Carpini at NOAA.gov and uh, we love to hear from you. The only way we can make these webinars better is by uh, uh, getting your honest feedback. So uh, we're very uh, open to that. And uh, at the end of this webinar, uh, one of our forecasters, meteorologist Rodney Chai, will give you an overview of the weather uh, for the remainder of the week into the weekend. So that should be a nice way to wrap up this uh, presentation. So again, welcome to the uh, webinar on the February 15th, 16th icing event. I could uh, advance my slides here. There we go. Okay, so um, besides the webinar tonight, we also have another webinar uh, tomorrow evening, Citizen Science. That's at 7 p.m. We also have one next week on extreme weather in southern New England. That's uh, next Tuesday. And then the Tuesday following that on the 16th, we have one on global uh, weather patterns. So uh, register for as many as you like. And if you can't attend one of these, no worries. We do um, archive these, and they're recorded on our uh, YouTube channel. And again, you could go uh, to this website here, weather.gov, Boston webinars, uh, to sign up for them 
and also uh, reach the YouTube uh, channel there. Okay, well, this will be a, a team effort tonight. Uh, myself, Frank Nocera, I'm a lead meteorologist at the National Weather Service in Boston, Taunton, and uh, meteorologist Rodney Chai and Bill Leatham will be uh, teaming up with me to deliver this webinar. So some of the uh, key questions going into this event, um, you know, forecasting-wise as this event was approaching was uh, one of the key questions or forecast challenges was how much ice accretion we will see across the region. What really made this storm complicated is that we weren't just dealing with an all-snow event, an all-ice event. Um, it was actually going to be a mixed precip event. We were going to have three different precipitation types, snow, sleet, freezing rain, and then eventually changing over to all rain. So a challenge was to forecast how much of each precipitation type, snow, sleet, freezing rain, and then also the duration of each of those precipitation types. So anytime you have, you know, more than one precipitation type, it is extremely complex because, again, you're not just forecasting amounts, but also duration. Uh, so very, very challenging event. And then how would we effectively communicate all of these threats? So uh, here is uh, what the map looked like uh, leading up to this event. And if you remember, this was uh, on the heels of that big ice and um, snow and cold event that we had uh, in, all the way down into the southern plains that impacted Texas, Oklahoma. And uh, the map here to the left shows you all the winter weather headlines, what the storm watches, warnings, advisors, all the way from uh, New Mexico, Texas, right through the lower Mississippi Valley, Ohio Valley, and into the Northeast. So just an incredible amount of real estate here being impacted by winter weather. You just don't see this very often. Um, and not surprising, look at this tight uh, temperature gradient that you had uh, across the United States. So, you know, your jet stream is right in here and you have, you know, two dramatic um, differences in air mass. Um, you know, wind chills, I think these are minus 22 across the panhandle of Texas, minus 27. And then, you know, heat indices in the low 90s in South Florida. So uh, definitely a, a good setup for some very active weather. Okay, before we uh, dive into the event, we should uh, just kind of refresh, go over um, two different methods for ice accretion, uh, measuring ice accretion. The one on the left is uh, radial ice accretion, and the example here on the right is flat ice accretion. So the one on the left here, we're looking at ice accretion on a, on a branch, and in this example here, um, they're showing you the average the average ice on the right side of the branch is about 3 sixteenths, and then the average ice on the left side is about 7 sixteenths. So if you add 3 sixteenths and 7 sixteenths, that gives you 10 sixteenths. But we're interested in the radius, not the diameter. So you take half of that and you get 5 sixteenths. Well, 5 sixteenths is roughly about a third of an inch of radial ice, but you round, you round that to the nearest tenth. So instead of reporting, you know, 0.33, you round it down to um, to three tenths. So, uh, in this example here, we actually have 0.3 or three tenths of an inch of radial ice accretion. The other way to measure ice is also on a flat surface, and in this example here, this would be a half inch of flat ice accretion. Now, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship, radial ice to flat ice or vice versa. And this chart here, I think, shows it nicely. Um, and I'll focus kind of on this half inch. Um, um, amount here. Uh, this is flat surface ice and is basically what our forecast is. And if you had to convert it to radial ice, what you would find on branches and wires. So our beginning threshold for ice, um, ice warning, winter storm warning, ice storm warning would be a half inch of flat ice. Well, that would correspond to about two tenths of an inch of radial ice. And this is the time, this is the amount of ice where things start to get interesting. If we have flat ice and studies and past winter storms have shown, when your flat ice starts to exceed a half inch or your radial ice starts to exceed two tenths of an inch, that's that's enough ice to where branches start to snap and then you know we get into the uh, power outage issues. So um, if you if you measure you know again a half inch of flat ice would correspond to two tenths of inch of radial ice. I know this you know this is this is even difficult for us measuring as meteorologists. So just do your best uh, and indicate when you do report to us whether it's flat ice or radial accumulation. And what's really helpful is if you send us a photo uh, with your ruler 
uh, and you, you know you send us the picture of the radial ice with your ruler or the flat ice and then send it on social media that'd be very helpful if we could have a visual with that so again just do your best um, it's not very easy okay so what happened with this event on the 15th and 16th well here's um, a picture from Lexington Mass uh, in the 128 corridor this was a multi-car accident uh, that took place I believe just on the tail end of rush hour and not a lot of ice fell in the Lexington area, but as we know from past, you know, past events, it doesn't take a lot of ice to cause treacherous travel. And you can see here 128 uh, had to be closed for quite some time because uh, this multi-car uh, accident. There were accidents, you know, throughout the region. And you can see here on uh, some more reports that we, we received over Twitter. Uh, this is a report here on the left from uh, one of our observers in Sterling, Mass., 800 feet. Uh, Gary's reporting uh, radial ice of uh, eighth of an inch, um, liquid precipitation four tenths. So you know an eighth, an eighth of an inch. I mean that's that's you know somewhat significant, not not enough to snap branches, uh, but again enough ice to impact travel. And then uh, Rodney, uh, one of our presenters tonight, snapped this from uh, Attleboro, and this is really a classic you know picture. Look how look how wet the roads uh, look, but with temperatures in the twenties, we know. This isn't wet. This is actually icy, and it doesn't take much ice again uh, to have some travel issues, as you can see there with the picture from Lexington. And even more reports coming in that evening uh, on social media. Massachusetts uh, State Police telling us uh, 128 in the area of Burlington experiencing uh, icy conditions. Several cars have spun out uh, here in Medfield. Uh, there was actually some injuries, uh, people falling, slipping. Um, injury so pretty pretty tough um, conditions that evening and even mass uh, mass dot is advertising um, or we were advertising icy conditions that night so again you know it doesn't take a lot of ice to cause travel problems and that was definitely the case uh, for this event now here are some of the reports that we received uh, throughout the region and you can see the the ice amounts, you know, they're not, they're less than a half inch than our warning criteria, but still, you know, quarter inch to two tenths of an inch of ice, a good part of northern Massachusetts, um, that is significant. And then even right into downtown Boston, East Boston, this is, you know, where uh, Logan Airport is, over a tenth of an inch of, of ice accretion, and uh, as well as Lexington, where we saw those uh, spin outs and, and accidents there. So, uh, you know, for Downtown Boston, uh, East Boston especially, that, that's a pretty good amount of ice uh, that far east. Here's what the uh, weather map looked like 10 o'clock that evening, and this red line kind of denotes the um, freezing line uh, across the area, and it pretty much matches up just to the south and east of I-95 in southeast Massachusetts, and then, you know, just to the south of uh, 95 in Rhode Island. And you can see these are the air temperatures. Air temperatures across the, the region, much of the region are in the uh, upper 20s to lower 30s. So really cold air mass over the region. But when it comes to forecasting freezing rain and ice, the, it's not just the air temperature that that's important. It's also the dew point temperatures, uh, how dry the air mass is. And you can see on this uh, surface map here, uh, the top number is the air temperature. The lower number is the dew point temperature. So we had dew points in the 20s throughout the region. Even here in Boston, it's about 27 air temperature, 26 dew point. Um, even here in the Hartford area, the, the air temperature is you know, straddling, freezing 31 degrees, but the dew point is 28. So what that tells us is that if dew points are in, are in the 20s, as soon as we start to get precipitation, the air mass actually has the potential to cool to the dew point temperature. Um, so this is not just a cold air mass, but it's a, it's a relatively dry air mass. So it really has a lot of potential, cooling potential. And we call that evaporational cooling uh, if we, whenever we get precip falling into uh, an air mass and temperatures are falling to the dew point temperature. So again, yes, it's cold enough. Uh, for freezing rain and ice, but it's also a relatively dry air mass. So what that tells us, it's going to take some time to modify this air mass and to erode uh, the cold, the shallow cold air that we have over southern New England. So that was really a key into this forecast was um, not just how cold it was, but also it was a relatively dry air mass and had potential for even additional cooling. All right, let's take a look at some freezing rain drizzle concepts um, before we actually dive into the forecast. So some things to consider, well, we 
we consider when we forecast freezing rain, freezing drizzle and ice, is what's, what is the precipitation rate going to be? Well, raindrops are relatively warm. And what I mean by that, it's, we're not dealing with snow, we're not dealing with ice, you know, this is liquid water. So it's relatively, relatively warm, the raindrops. Well, to freeze, for that water to freeze, heat must be removed. So when we remove the heat from the raindrops for it to freeze on the, on the ground, the surface, the cars, the walkways, whatever sidewalks, heat has to be removed. So that heat has to go somewhere. Uh, some of it could go into the ground. Some of it could go into the air. So um, depending on how much precip you have, it's possible that the air temperature will creep up just from the heat being removed from those water droplets. And that, that's called latent heat release. Um, so keeping that in mind, uh, at greater precipitation rates, uh, water does not have time to freeze to the surface. Because um, again, it takes time to remove that heat. So initially, the first you know, water droplets will freeze, but then as the precipitation gets heavier, the rain gets heavier, um, additional water is added and it just runs off. So heavy precipitation is not really that efficient uh, of uh, ice accretion. Drizzle is much more efficient because um, it's less less raindrops you're going to have. So it's going to be less heat that you're going to have to remove. So you're not going to raise air temperatures or ground temperatures as rapidly as if the precipitation uh, was heavy. So hopefully that makes sense. And if not, we could uh, come back to it at the end. Some other things that we consider when forecasting ice is also wind speed. Wind speed is important. Increased wind leads to increased horizontal moisture flux. So basically you have a greater chance of these raindrops contacting the surface. So if you have some wind, you could spread those uh, water droplets out. They come into contact with more cold surface. You know, if you start forming puddles, you want a little bit of, of wind to actually spread that water so it comes into contact with more cold surface. So getting back to our um, to what we were talking about on the previous slide, raindrops are warm. So to freeze, heat must be removed. And wind is an effective mover of heat. A great example of this is if you're outdoors in the winter, if you're shoveling, you're skiing, whatever you're doing outdoors, if it's a windy, cold day, well, that wind is going to remove your body heat away from your body, and you're going to get cold. That's essentially the wind chill effect. Um, versus if you're outside shoveling or skiing and it's cold, but there's calm wind, there's no wind, it's much different. Your body heat is not going to escape as easily as on a windy day. So same thing when we're forecasting ice, a little bit of wind actually helps ice accretion. So wind is an effective mover of heat. Um, and that just goes along with this um, other uh, note here. Strong cold wind removes heat from the surface, promoting quicker freezing. So you want so if in an ideal, if you want, or if you're anticipating a very icy event, freezing drizzle is more conducive to building ice than heavy rain, and some wind is more conducive than no wind. And again, I know it's kind of complex. If it doesn't make sense, we could uh, touch on it at the end. And just one last thing here, wet bulb temperature. Uh, this wet bulb temperature is basically, you have your air temperature, you have your dew point temperature. And if you remember, I said your dew point temperature is, is how, how low your, your air temperature could get. It could cool potentially as low as, as your dew point, or it can meet somewhere in the middle, and that would be your wet bulb temperature. So um, again, raindrops are warm to freeze heat must be removed. Um, and just getting back here, why is wet bulb? Uh, wet bulb helps account for evaporational cooling. Like I said in the example there, we had temperatures um, in like Hartford was 31 over 28. Yeah, it's getting close to freezing, but you do points 28. You have some room there for additional cooling if precip once precipitation arrives. So again, wet bulb temperatures, dew point temperatures um, are very important uh, and maybe more important than the, the actual air temperature. And that's where this um, graphic is, is, is trying to uh, communicate to you. An important finding is that freezing rain commonly occurs with air temperatures at or slightly above freezing, but freezing rain rarely occurs when your wet bulb temperatures are warmer than freezing. So your dew point temperatures are really important. Dew point and wet bulb temperatures are very important. You, you, need, you need some dry air to kind of sustain that cold, that cold air mass. Um, once your dew point temperatures and wet bulb temperatures get above 32, you can no longer sustain that cold that cold air mass. And hopefully that makes some sense. And again, if it doesn't, uh, we'll come back to it at the end. Now, the other um, item that's 
important, especially this time of year in March, is the diurnal variations. Very difficult to get freezing rain during the middle of the day in March. Not impossible, but very difficult. You have to overcome the high sun angle. And even on a cloudy day, there's some solar uh, insulation that is making it through the clouds. Um, and this graph is just showing you here that um, uh, the solar maximum, and this is local time, so this is 1400, about 2 p.m., um, the number of freezing rain observations decrease as you as you approach um, the max heating part of the day, which is 2 p.m. So the more favorable time to get freezing rain this time of year would be at night, obviously. And then as you go into the max heating of the day, uh, it would be more difficult. And that's why freezing rain events are a lot more common when you have the lower sun angle um, in January and also in December. So again, um, any questions we'll, we'll, we'll take at the end, just put them in the, uh, in the comment box and we'll get to them. So I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Bill Letham and uh, give him a chance to uh, discuss model guidance. So all yours, Bill. All right, thank you very much, Frank. And so we're gonna take a look at here at, at a couple of different models that the forecasters um, coming up to this event would have been able to look at um, you know, for, for, for pred what we're predicting. Um, so right here, this is one of the, the forecast models that we look at a lot nowadays. It's the high resolution ensemble forecast system. And so this would have been on the 14th. Uh, this would have been the run in the morning on the 14th. And this is what the precipitation type would have been starting um, around 7 p.m. on the 15th. Um, so, th so if you look across southern New England, much of the interior snow, but across Connecticut and Rhode Island, you've even got some freezing rain and also a little bit of a wintry mix in there. And then if you go on to the next slide, Frank. And then uh, as you can see, as we go forward here, all that precipitation that was over the mid-Atlantic, um, the freezing rain, wintry mix, uh, and even a little bit of rain and snow spreading into Southern New England. Um, you know, a, a, much of the interior, either as snow, freezing rain, or a wintry mix, and then this would be around 1 a.m. on the on the 16th of February. Um, so you know, getting into into the the middle of the event, and then if you keep going, Frank, to the next slide, um, and then still continue on into the event. Um, this would be on the 16th uh, at 7 a.m. Where you can see that precipitation, um, you know, is starting to get warmer air across uh, across the coastal plain. Uh, with this model showing that it would be primarily rain. However, it's still a pretty good signal um, for freezing rain or a wintry mix across the interior of, of southern New England, you know, uh, Connecticut Valley, uh, Worcester, and, and places further, further west. And so here, um, so this would be the, the model that uh, uh, forecast from the high res resolution ensemble forecast system that folks had on the 14th during our day shift. Um, and then what this is, is it's got a 24 hour FRAM accretion, which is, it's a, basically a statistical model that is, that is used basically to determine how much freezing rain accumulation is, uh, is anticipated. Um, and if you can see here, um, so from this model, um, you know, a good portion of southern New England, uh, the model's forecasting that there'll be freezing rain accumulation. But uh, the one thing that I want to highlight is kind of what Frank um, was talking about earlier, which was that, you know, that half inch uh, ice amount is, is kind of what, where we get, um, you know, where we get concerned. And that's where those bluer, the, the, the blue colors are. Um, but, you know, it's still, no matter how much freezing rain you get, it's still significant. Um, but, you know, that half inch amount is usually what we're looking at when we're starting to put out um, you know, we're looking towards like ice storm warnings, that kind of that kind of thing. Um, so this would be the model run that we looked at on the day shift or had the, the day prior to the event. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, Frank, this would have been the forecast guidance that that folks had um, later that day or, or more likely would be our midnight shift um, looking in ahead for the next day. Um, and as you could see, you know, that, that half inch amount um, that spread into uh, the interior um, but we still have, you know, significant accumulations over a quarter, a quarter of an inch across a good portion of the region. But again, kind of highlighting that the interior would be the, the, the biggest risk of, of uh, significant ice accumulation. So to, to kind of get into uh, what we're looking at at forecasters, um, you know, if, if you want to kind of see what's, 
behind the thinking of, you know, how do we figure out what type of precipitation is going to fall? Usually we're looking at forecast soundings, and these are just a couple examples of how we determine if it's going to be snow, um, freezing rain, or rain. Now, in this case, um, if you look at the temperature, which is the blue, blue line, the temperature stays completely below zero degrees Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit, which would be freezing. Um, so if we've got precipitation falling in this, uh, in this sounding, um, what it would show is that it's going to be all snow. So now to get a, just a little more complicated, um, you know, what, what will happen is in this instance is we're looking at a, a sleet sounding here, which is uh, precipitation starts above as snowfall. And then what happens is it falls into a shallow warm layer. Um, which where the temperatures are above above freezing so it makes it uh, warm enough that the snow is going to melt into rain and then what happens after that is there's a pretty deep cold layer and basically all that rain completely freezes and as it hits the ground it becomes sleet so it has enough time to go from uh, from snow to rain all the way back to to ice in this instance so that's why we in, in this case that's one of the other potential scenarios you can get into depending on how warm uh, warm a, a layer is aloft. And then lastly, kind of what, you know, we're primarily dealing with uh, for a good portion of our area for this event, but again, we also even had some sleet in, is, you know, you start out again with snow aloft. However, we have a pretty deep warm layer, uh, a little higher up in the atmosphere, and that is able to completely melt the rain. Uh, and then the tricky thing um, is that in this instance is it is a shallow cold layer and, and so it's not deep enough where the rain can completely freeze um, but it's enough where it can become a super cooled liquid water droplet and then once it con makes contact on a surface it can freeze so that's that that's actually one of the nuances that it comes with forecasting these kind of precipitation types is determining you know the the difference between sleet and freezing rain it's it's not it's not the easiest thing to do, um, but we do have some tools to help us out with that. And if you go over to the next slide here, Frank, you'll see um, one of the things that we look at at our office is buff kit. I don't know if I'm sure we've had another um, other presentations, um, but so here is a, a model forecast sounding from the the NAM model, um, and this is for Worcester, Mass, at 5 a.m. on the 16th. And if you remember. Um, the, the, the kind of thing we were looking at before, you've got that, you've got precipitation falling above where our freezing line is, which is the yellow, and it's gonna be all snow above that. And then what's happening is it's falling into this warm layer where temperatures are above freezing. And the warm layer in this instance is four degrees Celsius is like the maximum amount of warmth in that layer. And because of, it falls into this layer, they completely melt. And then what happens is below that layer, we get into a cold layer. Now, in this case, if the cold layer is not deep enough to cause it to refreeze and be sleet, and that's why if you look on the left-hand side um, of the, the model sounding, it even gives you um, what the precipitation type is expected. In this instance, is freezing rain. And this is just one model's representation of it from 5 a.m. on the 16th. Now the thing is, is that we look at multiple different models when we're when we're uh, putting together a forecast. So if you look at the next slide, this is another model that we look at frequently, the GFS. Um, and in this instance, uh, same time frame, but there's a significant difference between this model run and uh, what the NAM had. Uh, in in this instance, we've still got snow falling into a warm layer, but this warm layer is a lot deeper than that warm layer that the uh, the NAM model showed. Um, and also the other thing too is yes, the snowflakes completely melt, but if you look that cold layer at the, in the lower levels just falls below uh, the freezing line. So in this instance, that's why on the left-hand side here, you see the model is forecasting a plain rain. It's because it doesn't have enough time to cool for it to even become super cooled. So it just stays rain. Now, one of the things um, that, you know, we look at these models enough, we can pick up on different biases that these models have. Um, and the GFS actually has a bias of not holding on to the low level cold air. Um, and that is one thing that we take into account. And not only that, um, you know, we lie, we lie kind of heavily nowadays on the high resolution ensemble forecast system, which is a combination of multiple different models. Um, so 
that's kind of what we lean more towards, especially when these kind of events, because they do, they tend to do a little, a little better. Um, and if you go to the next slide, now I'm going to pass this on to Rodney for for the messaging for the event. Yeah, thank you so much, Bill. Uh, let's talk a, a little bit about uh, how we messaged uh, the event as um, it drew closer. Um, so we started the email briefings for our emergency managers on Friday, February the 12th. And, um, it, you know, remember the event was February 15 to 16. So this is uh, still more than three days out. And um, at, at this time range, we kind of wanted to give them a more general idea of what to expect as opposed to specific amounts and even actually the precipitation types at what time. Um, but, you know, to kind of convey the idea that the of a wintry mix could uh, unfold um, in about three to four days' time. Um, and, and this weather map here is uh, it's, it's actually produced by the Weather Prediction Center, and it kind of shows you, um, you know, the overall idea of, um, you know, the setup that could lead to a freezing rain event. Um, some of you may remember um, there was an Arctic outbreak for the middle part of the country. Uh, you can see on this map very clearly that uh, the Arctic high extended all the way from Canada into uh, the Mexican border. And for us here in southern New England, we are kind of on the fringe of this uh, Arctic air mass. And, um, and because of that, we are, um, it makes us kind of like favorable for um, active weather because the storm likes to track on the fringe of the, um, you know, a sharp contrast in air mass. So you have the Arctic air mass over the central part of the country, but then to our south and east, it's still kind of moist and warm. So um, that's why we, um, you know, even like a, up to a week ago, we were in an active weather pattern, you know, with uh, repeated chances for, um, for wintry precipitation. And so uh, 48 hours out uh, before the event, we um, issued a winter storm watch. And, um, you know, across much of the area, except for the immediate coast. And, and it's clear to be, to make the distinction between a watch and a warning, and even an advisory. Um, so a watch means that conditions may become favorable uh, for, for winter weather conditions. And there could be three different outcomes for a watch. Either they can be converted to a warning or an advisory or nothing. So totally all the headlines drop altogether. Um, one way to think about it is that a watch is meant to fail half the time. So, you know, so it is actually normal for you to be in a watch, but then, you know, you end up with no headlines because as our confidence increases that, um, you know, a less impactful event would be expected. But on the other hand, a watch would be converted to a warning or an advisory based on uh, the criteria. And in this case, um, you know, we're looking at potential ice accretion and an ice storm warning would require half an inch of ice. Um, Whereas for an advisory, it only requires a trace of ice to meet the criteria because, you know, you really only need like a thin layer of ice on the roads to cause hazardous travel. So, um, you know, trace of ice may not look sound like a lot, but it is um, very impactful. Um, so, and in this case, and I think uh, the next slide, please. Um, so this was kind of our I believe it's the, the first cut for expected ice accumulation. And um, and you can see that, you know, pretty much um, no ice accretion expected for, you know, areas closer to the coast. But further inland, uh, you can see towards interior Massachusetts and Northwest Connecticut, especially the high terrain, um, they can stay colder a little bit longer. 
you know, you can really get um, upwards of a quarter to half an inch of ice. So, um, and that's really why we went with the winter storm watch because there is a, the potential for up to half an inch of ice. And, um, you know, also some of you may remember there was a, a brief burst of snow at the front end before it switched over to uh, freezing rain. And, and in this case, um, the snow was really not too much of a concern. Uh, the ice was really the, uh, our primary concern. And putting it all together, um, you know, as our confidence increases that we're going to see less than half an inch of ice, uh, we converted the watches to winter weather advisory uh, for, in, and you can see on the bottom left right corner, um, for parts of the interior, a 10 to a quarter of an inch of ice, and it further east towards the I-495 corridor, I-95 corridor, uh, that's less than 10 of an inch of ice. And uh, taking a look at, you know, some more synoptic um, observations. And in this case, um, what you're seeing here is, um, you know, we have been showing you the model guidance, but this is actually what was observed in uh, the upper reaches of the atmosphere. And in this case, a uh, 500 millibar, 18,000 feet above sea level. That's kind of halfway between um, the top of the atmosphere and uh, the surface. And what you're seeing here is that you see a broad trough, uh, what we call a 500 millibar trough. And, uh, you know, we are kind of like on the, kind of on the fringe of the trough. And in this kind of pattern, uh, notice the, the winds are kind of from the Southwest. And this wind direction is really helpful to transport moist and warm air into New England. And, you know, so you basically you're setting up, you know, warm, you're having warm air, you know, well over freezing uh, air mass being transported over a cold dome at the surface. And when this happens, this is a classic setup for freezing rain. And um, so, you know, this is 850 millibars, so um, further down the atmosphere, 5,000 feet, um, you can see kind of like a close low um, just to our west towards uh, Buffalo, New York. And when when this happens, it um, we are kind of on the east side of this low, and the wind direction at this level would be straight from the south. And that's a, a very favorable wind direction for rich moisture to be transported um, straight into southern New England. And uh, this is, you know, another depiction at 850 millibar, same level as the previous slide. And the darker red um, colors that would really represent uh, where the high, the richest moisture resides. And, um, and you can look at the arrows that's basically uh, flux um, and that shows you how the, the direction where the moisture is being pulled towards and uh, again not surprising certainly you have moisture pulled towards New England and um, finally looking at going all the way down to the surface this is the, the surface map that most people are familiar with you can see kind of like a um, you know, a week, the primary low kind of like tracks well to our west um, over New York State. But then notice that a secondary low pressure is trying to develop um, closer to southern New England. And, you know, these are very subtle features that, um, you know, the near term forecasters have to be uh, vigilant because, you know, this kind of features um, could you know, result in a significant change in the wind direction as the event unfolds. And uh, because of this secondary low pressure development, the, the surface wind direction, especially towards the interior of Massachusetts and Connecticut, is actually from the north. 
And so basically this is this allows colder stop freezing air to drain down from uh, the valleys in New Hampshire and even uh, Vermont and kind of keep the stop freezing temperature at the surface longer and potentially prolonging the duration of the freezing rain event. So again, very subtle feature, 1,002 millibar surface low, but again, um, you know, you know, instead of having the wind shift to the east, you have it like from the north and uh, that helps to keep the colder temperatures around longer. And then by early afternoon, the secondary low has kind of lifted into the Gulf of Maine, but um, it's still kind of close enough to southern New England to allow for the winds, especially in the east slopes of the Brookshire, Brookshires, to be from the from the north. But um, but in areas further east, um, would sort of change over to rain as the, the wind direction kind of uh, um, shifted to the south and helping to warm the surface temperature above freezing. And this is a mediogram um, uh, from the Worcester Airport. And you can see um, the weather symbols in the red box. That's a freezing rain um, weather symbol. And then on the where the green box is, you can see the two dots that represents um, light to moderate rain. So uh, the mediogram is, um, is very helpful to, to show you different parameters, uh, including temperature, wind direction and um, the weather type. Okay, so at this point, uh, I think I would uh, pass it back to uh, to Frank to you know, answer any questions that, that you may have. Okay, so let's see. Uh, all right, so first question here is uh, how rare are icing events that hit or exceed the threshold of a half inch of flat ice accumulation? Um, well, I could take that and um, it, it's pretty rare. We don't have that many events um, that reach or exceed a half inch. Um, it, it's not too common. I'm trying to think the last event that we had, I can't even remember <laughs> when was the last time, but um, obviously the one, the event that sticks out was the uh, 2008 event that was a really significant uh, icing event for western massachusetts but um, i'm sure we've had some since then but uh, it is pretty rare most of the events fall into the winter weather advisory event which is you know less less than a half inch as uh, rodney had uh, stated uh, another question here assuming freezing rain is falling from a warmer air mass above does heavier rain fall also bring with it the warmer air above. Uh, so we'll take turns here. Uh, Rodney or uh, Bill want to take a crack at that? Yeah, I could try to take a crack at this, Frank. Uh, I'm not, maybe I think I know what you're getting at here. Um, so when we have freezing rain, I, maybe this is what you're alluding to, that the, typically actually when you get freezing rain, it's kind of interesting is it's a, it's, it's just, it's a, a process that once the freezing rain hits the ground, uh, it, it actually is a warming process um, because it's releasing latent heat. Um, and so that's actually when we see freezing rain, um, if this is kind of what you're alluding to, you'll actually see temperatures uh, increasing. Now that's why it's, it's typically pretty difficult to get a long duration freezing rain event is because, um, because when you get freezing rain, it, it's actually helps warm things up and, and to, for it to sustain, usually what you need is, is, a, is colder air coming in. So um, I think that might, maybe that'll answer your question if, if, I'm, if I'm tackling it right, um, unless Rodney's got something else to add or, or you do, Frank. No, I, I think uh, you handle that pretty well, Bill. Uh, Rodney, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, no, Frank and Bill, I think Bill did a great job to answer the question. All right, so our next question, Rodney, we'll give to you just so we uh, spread the wealth here. Um, so this is from Scott. He, he works at uh, the U.S. Coast Guard sector, southeastern sector, New England. How do we forecast freezing of public salt water and brackish waterways? I know it is a very variable question involving water temperatures, wind speed, 
and temperature, but are there any on the fly clues? Um, so you want to take that, Rodney? I guess it comes down to uh, us predicting you know, when salt water, when, when bays and harbors uh, would freeze. Yeah, um, yeah, I would take a crack at that question. Um, you know, from my, from my limited experience of forecasting in New England, I, you know, I think that you kind of need a, when you're talking about salt water, you probably need a prolonged period of sub freezing temperatures to, um, to get the ice to form. Um, just because the salt water has a lower freezing point than normal water, normal fresh water. Um, but I, yeah, I don't remember, um, at least. For myself, from my experience, I don't know of any tools that we we use to forecast, you know, exactly when the salt water waves would freeze up. So I wonder if uh, Frank or Bill, you would have any insights? Yeah, we we don't forecast when the um, you know the bays and harbors would uh, would freeze. Uh, but I could tell you that, I mean, since I've been working here, the more common areas to freeze, um, Nantucket. Sound and Cape Cod Bay, um, they tend out of all the bodies of water to uh, to freeze uh, more quickly than the other bodies of water. And that's mainly because Nantucket Sound is pretty shallow. I mean, I think the deepest parts of Nantucket Sound, it's, I think it's anywhere between 40 and 70 feet deep. It's pretty shallow. So there was one winter not that long ago uh, in the early 2000s where it actually froze completely over. And uh, as you, you would probably know, Scott, you're asking the question, um, the Coast Guard actually had to cut the ice, break the ice. So the uh, the ferry, Nantucket Ferry, could could go from Hyannis to, uh, to Nantucket. And also Cape Cod Bay is fairly shallow and that tends to, to ice over. But we don't, we don't forecast any of that. The one thing that we do forecast, which is your next question, Scott, is um, – uh, let's see here, the freezing spray. So yeah, we, we forecast spree, freezing spray. We work with the Coast Guard. Actually, some of our call to actions um, in the freezing spray advisories and warnings uh, come straight from the Coast Guard. Uh, so we do forecast freezing. We actually had a freezing spray advisory up just for Monday night, Tuesday morning, in this latest uh, Arctic blast that we had. So uh, we do forecast that. And uh, we work closely with uh, the Coast Guard as far as uh, messaging that. The uh, next question we have here is from Alexander. Uh, with a heavy sleet event, what warning would make sense? A winter storm warning, advisory, or an ice storm warning? So again, with, heavy, with a heavy sleet event, which doesn't happen that often, usually sleet events uh, it's usually a transition period, so the duration of sleet events is usually short, uh, but occasionally they, they could be longer. Um, so I'll give this to, to, to Bill if uh, we want to take a turn. So with a heavy sleet event, what warning would make sense? Winter, weather, winter storm warning, advisory, or an ice storm warning? So if you want to take that one, Bill. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, so, so for sleet, we actually treat um, if you go on our, like, uh, you could actually see it on our webpage and how we come up with like winter storm warnings, uh, advisories or ice, ice storm warnings. Um, so for, for heavy sleet that we actually treat it the same, the same way we would treat like a, like a snowfall event. Um, it's, if you get, I think it's six inches in 12 hours, eight and 24, that's, it would, it would, that's where we would make the delineation between like a winter storm warning, or if you're getting a lesser amount of an advisory, um, ice storm warnings are really only, uh, only for if we've got a freezing rain event where we're expecting, you know, over a half inch, but the, but the tricky thing with it is usually, you know, with these heavy sleet events or, 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 or something like that, it's usually not just heavy sleet by itself. Very rarely do you get, you know, just a, a, a true sleet event. Um, and I think, I think Frank, you could correct me if I'm wrong here. I don't think, um, I know we've got the ice storm warning in there, but I think it all is covered now under, uh, under a winter storm warning. Um, I don't think we have like the ice storm warning delineation anymore. Yeah, I think you may be right about that. And that actually just kind of confirms that, uh, 
ice storm warnings, you know, the half inch or greater criteria, it doesn't even happen that often. So it's, it's, yeah, you may be right about, about that, Bill. Yeah, I think with the hazard simplification, I think that's when they got, they got rid of. Yeah, that. yeah, that, that makes sense. All right, thank you, Bill. So another question here, and we'll give this uh, to Rodney just to keep spreading the wealth. Um, can the NAM model detect changes in the depth of the warm air aloft? So you want to take that, Rodney? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Frank, and um, thank you for the question. Um, so, you know, uh, this is would be an ideal situation to look at the, the model soundings and, you know, and I, I would say that, um, you know, the quick answer to the question would be yes, because, you know, eventually the models, um, you know, a lot of us, you know, who like winter weather, um, like to look at the, you know, forecast snow accumulation or like the, you know, the surface map with the precipitation types on on the models. Um, but in order for the models to get to that point, they will have to kind of almost like internally calculate, um, you know, look at the different layers of the atmosphere. And then if, you know, if there's ice or snow at the top of the atmosphere, is there any above freezing layer from the top of the atmosphere to the, to the surface? And and the models would actually, uh, you know, I, I think they do a great job of, you know, ingesting all this information and then giving you the most likely precipitation type. And, you know, and for us as forecasters or even weather enthusiasts, um, you know, people who are passionate about weather, uh, I encourage you to, when you look at models, um, model guidance next time, be sure, if you can, to click for the model sounding. And you can usually, if you, you know, if you go to the website, you can use the, either use the right click or left click, and then it would pull up a point sounding uh, for you. And then you can actually examine, okay, is there any um, layer that is above freezing? And, you know, usually if it is a thin layer of above freezing temperatures followed by a deep, sub freezing layer closer to the surface you get sleep but if you have um, a deep you know plus five celsius layer and then you know 20s on the ground then most likely you're going to get freezing range so um you know so i hope that this is helpful uh for the person who asked the question um and um yeah i would encourage you to look at the model soundings next time all right. Thank you, Rodney. Uh, there's one final question. I'll take that. And the question is from Kevin. Uh, do forecast soundings tell meteorologists where the freezing line will set up? Um, forecast soundings are extremely helpful, as uh, Rodney just pointed out, although each model is not perfect. And if it was perfect, we, we wouldn't have jobs. Um, so every model has its shortcomings, has its biases. Um, and just to touch on like what we were talking about, where the amount of precipitation could impact the temperatures, uh, the freezing line. So if the model doesn't have the amount of precipitation in the right location or the amount of precipitation correctly, well then, you know, from the latent heat release that we talked about, um, that's not going to be accurate and therefore the temperatures aren't going to be accurate. So um, they, they, they are very helpful. They do have their strengths. Um, so, in a general sense, they do tell us where the freezing line is, but they're not always exact. And that's where our um, pattern recognition and years of experience come in. And we try to fill in the gaps and try to see where the, the targets of opportunity are to improve the model guidance. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Um, if not, feel free to uh, enter more questions. What we're going to do right now is... Uh, Ronnie's actually going to give us a very brief uh, weather overview of the uh, the week ahead and into the weekend. So, uh, Ronnie, uh, take it away. Okay, thank you, Frank. And um, let's take a look at what we can expect for the next seven days. Um, so I hope that some of you uh, 
enjoy the uh, the mild weather today because the next few days are going to be um, going to go back to below normal temperatures and the temperatures for this time of the year at least for our um, major metropolitan areas are in the low to mid 40s so expect temperatures to be running 5 to 10 degrees below average uh, from tomorrow onwards um, through uh, the weekend and um, but then if you are a warm weather fan um, you know if you're looking forward to spring it's looking increasingly likely we're going to make a run for um, you know have multiple days in the 50s maybe even make a run for 60 uh, for some locations by the middle of next week so um, stay tuned for that if you uh, if you like uh, warm weather and you know as with you know for me I, I, I as, as a forecast and each forecast we kind of have our um, preferences um, you know things to look at when we um, you know, sit on the forecast desk. And I like to look at the, the bigger pattern, in this case, the what we call the teleconnections. And on the top, you see um, the AO, the Arctic Oscillation, and the bottom, you see the PNA, that's the Pacific North American pattern. And, and notice, um, I want to draw your attention to the AO um, graphic. Notice um, in the first week of February, um, the AO actually dipped um, to very negative territory, and that, when that happens, that actually favors um, a kind of a, a deeper intrusion of um, Arctic air um, from the high latitudes, um, you know, and it kind of favors it to come all the way, you know, all the way in this case to the deep south, and uh, that led to the Arctic outbreak that. Um, the middle part of the country experience at that time. And also notice the other thing, how it went from deeply negative territory to uh, neutral and then actually positive. So when the AO increases sharply over a short period of time, um, that actually is favorable for active weather across southern New England. And uh, not surprisingly, we actually did have a, quite a few um, minor to moderate events, including this freezing rain event um, for the, the middle part of February. So, um, and then uh, for the PNA, um, usually when you have a positive PNA, uh, that means that there's an upstream region. Um, so if you look at the 500 millibar pattern at 18,000 feet, um, so it kind of like, it, if you can picture like a sine curve, so you have the the region on uh, the western half of the country, and then you would tend to favor troughing and allowing the colder air to intrude into the eastern half of the country. So the negative PNA uh, would be at the opposite of that. So there would be a lack of upstream region, and as a result, there would be a, a lack of downstream troughing over the eastern half of the country. So, you know, so instead of being um, you know, flush with the colder Canadian air, we would be uh, experiencing the milder uh, Pacific uh, air. So, so in that in that case, the temperatures would be would trend more towards uh, above normal. And not surprisingly, the CPC um, Climate Prediction Center has uh, much of the eastern half of the U.S. in uh, have above a uh, higher probability of above normal temperatures and the darker the shading that's when they are they have the highest confidence of seeing above normal temperatures and that is of course relative to climatology doesn't mean that uh, uh, Michigan will get higher temperatures than us but um, that's according to their climatology and on the right hand side you see that um, for precipitation wise um, there is it's kind of, they're not as confident in the precipitation trend as the temperature trend, but, um, you know, they're betting that we will see uh, drier conditions uh, for for next week. So, so if you like warm weather and dry conditions, then uh, next week might be uh, perfect for you. And this is the um, forecast QPF. 
um, or liquid equivalent precipitation um, out through seven days, and you can see um, zero um, from the weather prediction center. So um, that is a huge signal for dry conditions. And so if you think that this winter has, um, you know, has not really featured anomalous warmth, unlike last winter, uh, when we had 70 degree days in January, um, you are not wrong. Uh, look at, you know, look at our four climate sites. Um, you know, the last day for, for Boston and Providence, um, where they saw above 50 degree uh, Fahrenheit was, um, you have to go back to January 16. And for Hartford and Worcester, you have to go back to last Christmas day. So it has been a while. And uh, just to give you a, a preview of what to uh, what you can expect maybe next week, um, these are the forecast high temperatures for uh, next Tuesday. And I mean, of course, this will be subjected to change um, because we are so far out. But uh, just to kind of give you a teaser, you can we can maybe expect low to mid fifties um, across the away from the immediate coast. And for uh, people who love spring weather, um, take a look at this um, National Phenology Network and showing the, um, where the, the leaves have started to develop across the country. Um, areas further south have started to see their trees bud and actually even see some uh, flowers blooming. And this red and blue shading represent, so the red shading means that um, the, the leaves came out earlier than normal and the, the blue shadings represent um, the leaves coming out later than normal. So uh, you can kind of see that um, the, the Arctic outbreak over the middle part of the country has kind of um, slowed down the onset of the leaves because um, prior to the Arctic outbreak, the, you know, the Southern Plains were having a warmer than all average winter. So that Arctic outbreak kind of uh, um, help to slow things down a little bit, but not by much. And uh, I think I believe this is, might be the last slide, if not the second last slide. Um, so this is the existing snow depth across the country, and um, really the snowpack has disappeared across much of the southern plains and central plains because a week after they got the Arctic outbreak, you know, places like Dallas was were, were pushing mid 80, so the snowpack were just kind of uh, disappeared quickly. And for us here in southern New England, uh, a lot of us in southeast Massachusetts and uh, into northeast Connecticut, um, the snowpack is gone. Um, and for those areas still holding on to the snowpack, um, you know, it's, it's looking like the, the snowpack is, is going to gradually diminish over the next week or two as well. So if you really want to find snow, you have to go north. So, um, you know, finally, thank you so much for, for your time and for listening to us. And I'll pass back to, uh, to Frank. Yeah, thank you, Rodney. Uh, great job, great presentation. One of the things that came to mind, Rodney, uh, <clears throat> when you were talking about the uh, mild weather coming in next week, and I agree with you, it uh, looks like, you know, solid 50s, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, maybe even to Friday, depends on the passage of uh, that front. Um, so, yeah, multiple days in the 50s, and uh, I agree with you, 60 degrees is, is possible. And uh, the other reminder, you know, for Rodney, Bill, myself, and, you know, anyone in the audience, uh, now that we're in March, this is the time of year where we see uh, the MOS, the model output statistics that we use. This is kind of like the transition season, March. So sometimes if you get a pretty warm air mass and once your snow cover um, is gone, uh, the moss could be too conservative because uh, I believe they're still operating under the cool season equations through March. I think April 1, they flip over to the warm season equation. So a lot of times you could get big bust 
on uh, temperature forecasts with the MOS guidance because it'll be too cool because it's using cool season equations. And now we're in March, the higher sun angle, especially once the snow cover uh, vanishes. So depending on how much snow cover we get rid of between now and next week, it'll probably be gradual because it's going to be cold. So uh, we'll probably get rid of it through sublimation rather than, uh, you know, melting. Uh, but especially where you were showing, Rodney, where the snow cover is already gone in much of uh, northeast Connecticut, Rhode Island, southeast Mass, especially once you get away from the ocean next week, you know, maybe there is a, a pretty good shot of 60 plus one of those days. Uh, so we'll have to see. Um, any other uh, last minute things you want to add, Bill or Rodney, before we sign off? I'm good, Frank. Okay, great. I think so, Frank. All right. Thanks so much, guys. And um, I believe if uh, if I could go back here just to uh, uh, the schedule for events that they have coming up. Okay, so let me just leave. We'll kind of leave off with this. So uh, hopefully you enjoyed tonight's webinar and uh, hopefully we, you know, we answered uh, your questions. If you have any feedback, again, uh, send it to that email address. Uh, it's the only way we can improve these webinars. And uh, here's the list of webinars to come. We have uh, one tomorrow night at 7 p.m., one next Tuesday, and then the following Tuesday. So uh, register at our webpage here, weather.gov, Boston. Uh, webinars. And if you can't make any presentation, uh, it'll be on our YouTube channel. Uh, Joe will probably have this one on uh, by sometime tomorrow. So thank you very much for your time. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something. And uh, thanks again, Ronnie and uh, Bill, for your help. Uh, hopefully my uh, rookie status uh, can be upgraded now. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. Uh, everyone have a great evening. Take care.